Hello! How's it going? I'm Mike. I'm Em. And we're reading The Count of Monte Cristo. It's so good to have you here. It's been a couple of days. We were doing some other stuff, but now we're back. We're back with Chapter 10 of The Count of Monte Cristo. There's there, a dog. There is there is still a dog. You might hear him ruffling around or, or nosing around or something back there. You might see a sort of a black poodle shape kind of go in and out. That's part of the reason why we haven't been reading for a couple of days. We've been getting used to this dog. It's not our dog. We're borrowing this dog. He's but, great. But he's great, and uh, but we're still getting used to him. Uh, all right, chapter ten. What just what just happened? Let's uh, um, let's dial back a little bit here. Oh yeah, scroll up a little more. Um, oh it was like sort of a, like a summary yeah like you you kind of we went through every character and we saw what they were feeling at sort of, sort of towards the end of the night danglar was like sleeping so sweetly because he's a cold-hearted man yeah mercedes and, is is wrecked Caderousse feels like regret yeah and this is mostly about villefort um going back home and talking with the Marquis and Marquis. Yeah, talking with his in-laws and talking with Rene. Oh, oh, and he was trying to set up this thing with the king, right? Like yeah, he wanted to like... Yeah, that's right. He's like, sell your land or whatever to his Well, I need to meet the king. Yeah, also sell your land. Right. Uh, but I need to meet with the king immediately. Right, right, right. That's right. And that might be what this meeting is all about, this chapter. Because it's called Chapter 10, The King's Closet at the Tuileries. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Tu Tuileries. Tuileries. Yeah, we actually looked that up. Um, uh, so uh, uh, we're doing our best here with the pronunciation. Uh, why don't you start this with this chapter? All right. We will leave Villefort on the road to Paris, traveling, thanks to trebled fees, with all speed and passing through two or three apartments. Enter at the Tuileries the little room with the arched window, so well known as having been the favorite closet of Napoleon and Louis the Eighteenth, and now of Louis Philippe. It's so interesting this first paragraph because it almost sounds like camera direction. Yeah, like, totally. Like the camera pans in and exactly. we see this and that and the other. Yeah, you know? it's curtains weird. part. You get the author's like direction, like notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there, seated before a walnut table. Ooh, that's nice. He had brought with him from Hartwell, and to which, from one of those fancies not uncommon to great people, he was particularly attached. The king, Louis the Eighteenth, was carelessly listening to a man of fifty or fifty-two years of age, with grey hair, aristocratic bearing, and exceedingly gentlemanly attire, and meanwhile making a marginal note in a volume of Griffius's Oh, there goes the poodle. Um, making a marginal note in a volume of Griffius's rather inaccurate, but much sought after, edition of Horace, a work which was much indebted to the sagacious observations of the philosophical monarch. Wow. Oh, these sentences are crazy. Yeah. Okay, so Louis the Eighteenth. I know nothing about the man. Me neither. This is post-Napoleon. Um, I think it was 14th that had the nice chairs, right? Uh, I forget. It's one of the Louis. And here, here he is reading some big book that's full of kind of like meh philosophy, I guess. Um yeah he's talking to a really fancy dude okay but he's not really interesting okay all right uh, let's see king's voice you say sir said the king that i am exceedingly disquieted sire really have you had the vision of the seven fat king and the seven lean king oh is this um is this like a Joseph from the Technicolor Dreamcoat reference? The seven fat cows and seven skinny cows? Oh, maybe. He had a dream about them. Oh, good question. I forget. N uh, no, sire, for that would only be token us for us seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity. And with a king as full of foul sight as your majesty, scarcity is not a thing to be feared. Then of what other scourge are you afraid, my dear black ass? Sire, I have every reason to believe that a storm is brewing in the south. Well, my dear Duke, replied Louis the Eighteenth, I think you are wrongly informed, and know positively that on the contrary, it is very fine weather in that direction. 
Man of ability as he was, Louis the Eighteenth liked a pleasant jest. Sire, continued Monsieur de Blacas, uh, if it is only to re- if it only be to reassure a face- faithful servant, will your Majesty send into Long a uh, Long Dock, Provence, and Dauphiné trusty men who will bring you back a faithful report as to the feeling in these three provinces. Um, can he mudis, er, can he miss sir dis, replied the king, continuing the annotations in his horse. Is that Latin? Yeah, totally. Okay. Cannabis, is that like dog? Dog something? Dog for sure? Dog. Dog for dog sure. Dog for sure. <laughs> All right. I'll take it. Go for it. Sire, replied the courtier, laughing, in order that he might seem to comprehend the quotation. (laughs) Your majesty may be perfectly right in relying on the good feeling of France, but I fear I am not altogether wrong in dreading some desperate attempt. By whom? By Bonaparte, or at least by his adherents. My dear Blacca, said the king, you with your alarms prevent me from working. And you, sire, prevent me from sleeping with your security. What? What? <laughs> that can't be what he means. Oh, you prevent me from sleeping with your oh, lax right. security, I guess? Got it. Okay. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> with your entire security team! <laughs> wait, wait, my dear sir, wait a moment, for I have such a delightful note on the Pastor Cum Trahere. Wait, and I will listen to you afterwards. There was a brief pause during which Louis the Eighteenth wrote, in a hand as small as possible, another note on the margin of his Horace, and then, looking at the duke with the air of a man who thinks he has an idea of his own, while he is only commenting upon the idea of another, said, Go on, my dear duke, go on, I listen. Sire, said Blackass, who had for the moment... Okay, I have to ask, is it Blackass, or is it Blackass, or a Blacka, or like... (laughs) It's probably Blacca. 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 But I don't, I don't, we could look it up. Let's go with Blacca. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sire, said Blacca, who had for a moment the hope of sacrificing Villefort for his own profit. I am compelled to tell you that these are not mere rumors destitute of foundation which thus disquiet me, but a serious-minded man, deserving all my confidence, and charged by me to watch over the cells. The duke hesitated as he pronounced these words has arrived by post to tell me that a great peril threatens the king, and so I hasten to you, sire. Maladuchus avidomum, continued Louis XVIII, still annotating. Such a cool customer. Yeah. Mm, Latin phrase. Latin, Latin, Latin. Does your majesty wish me to drop the subject? By no means, my dear duke, but just stretch out your hand. Which? Whichever you please, there to the left. Here, sire, I tell you to the left, and you are looking to the right. I mean, on my left. Yes, there. You'll find yesterday's report as a minister of police. But here's Mr. Dondre himself. And Monsieur Dondre, announced by the chamberlain in waiting, entered. Why don't you take it? Okay. Come in, said Louis the Eighteenth with repressed smile. Come in, Baron, and tell the Duke all you know. The latest news of Monsieur de Bonaparte. Do not conceal anything, however serious. Let us see, the island of Elba is a volcano, and we may expect to have issuing since flaming and bristling war. Bella, horrida bella. Horrible beauty, maybe? Is that Italian now? He's, yeah, he's just so cultured. So <laughs> cultured. Monsieur d'Andre leaned very respectfully on the back of a chair with his two hands and said, has your majesty perused yesterday's report? Yes, yes, but tell the duke himself who cannot find anything what the report contains. Give him the particulars of what the usurper is doing in his eyelet. Monsieur, said the baron to the duke, all the servants of his majesty must approve of the latest intelligence from uh, which we have from the island of Elba. Bonaparte... Monsieur d'André looked at Louis the Eighteenth, who, employed in writing a note, did not even raise his head. Bonaparte, continued the baron, is mortally wearied, and passes whole days in watching his miners at work at Porto Long... Long Longong. 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 And scratches himself for amusement, 
added the king. <laughs> Sick burn, my my liege. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> you let him have it. <laughs> uh, scratches himself, inquired the duke. What does your majesty mean? Yes, indeed, my dear duke. Did you forget that this great man, this hero, this demigod, is attacked with a malady of the skin which worries him to death? Prurigo? This like, guy is so pretentious. Yeah, seriously. Is Prurigo the condition? Or is that like, mm, in I think, Latin? <laughs> I think it's like, mm, but it seems like Italian to me. Okay. Prurigo. I don't know. Any Italian listeners, please confirm. Prurigo. Prurigo. Uh, and, uh, and moreover, my dear Duke, continued the minister of police. I thought he was the baron. Now he's the minister of police. There are three people in this room, right? Yeah, three. King, King, the, 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 Duke, the Duke, and and now this this Baron. guy. Yeah, all right. Andre. Okay. Uh, moreover, we are almost assured that in a very short time the usurper will be insane. Insane? Raving mad. His head becomes weaker. Sometimes he weeps bitterly, sometimes laughs boisterously, and at other times he passes hours on the seashore, flinging stones in the water, and when the flint makes duck and drake five or six times, he appears as delighted as if he had gained another Marengo or Austerlitz. I guess those were battles, I think. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, now you must agree that these are indubitable symptoms of insanity. I don't know. It just sounds like he's retired. Sounds like he's bored. Bored, retired, and skipping stones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. of wisdom, my dear Baron. Oh, of wisdom, said Louis the Eighteenth, laughing. The greatest captains of antiquity amuse themselves by casting pebbles into the ocean. See Plutarch's Life of Scipio Africanus. All right. Is this like? I don't know. Uh, this Louis the Eighteenth. Who, who's his audience? Like, are these guys like, oh yeah, Plutarch? Well, you know, it it wouldn't surprise me if uh, I don't know anything about the man. I don't know anything about the historical character of Louis the Eighteenth. But he comes off to me as someone who's like using the fact that he has all this leisure time to read yeah. books as like intellectual leverage on people. Like yeah. he can just like kind of quote some Latin or throw right. some phrase or a no reference at someone, and they're like, him. whoa, like I guess you're, I right. guess you're smart. Because you read the book. I guess you won <laughs> you the won, argument. You won, yeah. Um, Monsieur de Blaca pondered deeply between the confident monarch and the truthful minister. I'm trying to remember which one is Blaca now. Oh, he's the duke. Villefort, who did not choose to reveal the whole secret, lest another should reap all the benefit of the disclosure, had yet communicated enough to cause him the greatest uneasiness. Take over. Well, well, Dandre, said Louis the Eighteenth. Blaca is not yet convinced. Let us proceed, therefore, to the usurper's conversion. The minister of police bowed. The usurper's conversion, murmured the duke, looking at the king and Dandre, who spoke alternately like Virgil's shepherds. The usurper converted. Decidedly, my dear duke. In what way converted? To good principles. Tell him all about it, baron. Why? This is the way of it, said the minister, with the gravest air in the world. Napoleon lately had a review, and as two or three of his old veterans expressed a desire to return to France, he gave them their dismissal and exhorted them to serve the good king. These were his own words. Of that, I am certain. Well, Blaca, what think you of this? inquired the king triumphantly, and pausing for a moment from the volumina voluminous scol scoliest what? The big book? Voluminous scol scoliast? Help me out here. Scoliast. Scoliast before him. Does that just mean big book? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Voluminous. Dumas. Um, Dumas. So it sounds like Bonaparte went like, go, serves the real king. I think so. And, and the I king's like, well, I guess he's uh, on our team. Yeah. What do you think of that? I say, sire, that the minister of police is greatly deceived, or I am. And as it is impossible, it can be the minister of police, as he has the guardianship of the safety and honor of your majesty. It is probable that I am in error. 
However, sire, if I might advise, your majesty will interrogate the person of whom I spoke to you, and I will urge your majesty to do him this honor. Interrogate? It means just, like, talk to this guy, I think mm -hmm. is what he's saying. Most willingly, duke. Under your auspices, I will receive any person you please, but you must not expect me to be too confiding. Baron, have you any report more recent than this, dated the 20th February? February. Uh, <laughs> and this is the 3rd of March? Mar. <laughs> Janvier, February, yeah, yeah. Mar. Excuse me. February, yeah. Okay. yeah. February. <laughs> February. <laughs> Janvier, février, 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 and what's March? Mar. 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 All right. No, sire, I am hourly expecting one. It may have arrived since I left my office. Go, scissor, and if there be none, well, well, continued Louis the Eighteenth, make one. If that is the usual way, it is. It is it not? Said the king, laughing facetiously. Wait, he wants a report, and if there's not one there, just make one up? Okie dokie. I yeah. guess, yeah. All right. Yeah. Why don't you take it from there? Okay. Uh, the minister of police is a new guy. A uh, new guy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sire, replied the minister, we have no occasion to invent any. Every day our desks are loaded with most circumstantial denunciations, coming from hosts of people who hope to hope for some return for services which they seek to render but cannot. They trust to fortune and rely upon some unexpected event in some way to justify their predictions. Well, sir, go, said Louis the Eighteenth, and remember that I am waiting for you. I will but go, oh, I will but go and return, sire. I shall be back in ten minutes. Uh, I'm just, I, I took a moment there to reread this. It sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong here, it sounds like, uh, m Sire, my desk is covered with random accusations. People just like throw accusations like crazy hoping that something will stick. Is yeah, that what we're seeing here? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. They they say stuff and they hope that it's ra it is randomly true. Something in there will justify the prediction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I shall be back in ten minutes. <laughs> and I, sire, said Monsieur de Blacas, will go and find my messenger. Wait, sir, wait, said Louis the Eighteenth. Really, Monsieur de Blacas, I must uh, change your armorial bearings. Armorial bearings? Okay. I will give you an eagle with outstretched wings, holding in its claws a prey which tries in vain to escape, and bearing this device, Tanax. What? I don't know what that means. Is As a parting gift, <laughs> take this eagle. <laughs> I give one to every one of my guests. <laughs> also, what the hell is Tanax? Is he trying to sell him on something? Check this device. It's from Apple. It's called a Tenax. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard of this? It makes your cheeks very rosy. Mm, so you good. Can sell it in a pyramid scheme. <laughs> um, what is he talking about? Okay, so I'm going to give you... Is I'm this gonna, a he's metaphor? Like, I'm going to give you something that will allow you to, like, yeah, catch your prey more easily, I guess. Here's an eagle with outstretched wings who's holding in its claws a prey. And bearing this device. Maybe is it a... I have no idea. Yeah, let's see what, what happens next. All right. Oh, here, who oh. do we have here? This is the chief of police. Um, I guess. Dondre. Yeah. Blaka is the the duke. The duke, yeah. So this must be the minister of police. He looks pretty sour. He's got, like, nice cows. Nice legs. Yeah, I Little agree. Tights on. All right. Um... Sire, I listen, said de Blacas, biting his nails with impatience. Uh, okay, so the king is just going off on some weird... Okay. I wish to consult you on this passage. Molly fugien am helitu. You know it refers to a stag flying from a wolf. This king is insufferable. I can't yeah. stand this guy. <laughs> no wonder Black yes. is like trying to get out of here. Yeah, please let me go. Wait, wait. Here's an obscure reference. 
What do you think? <laughs> uh, are you not a sportsman and a great wolf hunter? Well then, what do you think of the Molly Angelitu? Admirable, sire, but my messenger is like the stag you refer to, for he has posted 220 leagues in scarcely three days. Which is undergoing great fatigue and anxiety, my dear duke. When we have a telegraph which transmits messages in three or four hours, and that without getting in the least out of breath. Um, okay. Ah, sire, you recompense but badly this poor young man, who has come so far, and with so much ardor, to give your majesty useful information. If only for the sake of Monsieur de Salvier, who recommends him to me, I entreat your majesty to receive him graciously. Now, this may have been just a very roundabout way of saying, why didn't they just wire? Why did they send a messenger? Because if they've got a telegraph... Yeah. And one of the reasons why you wouldn't send a telegraph is then you rely on someone receiving and writing down the message on the other side unless it's right. being coded. Right. So I wonder if, like, the, the king is actually being really kind of clever here, trying to sniff out, like, what is this? What mm. is this weird situation? Yeah, why Yeah. Why are you doing it this way? But it's so weird because it's, the king is very obtuse. Uh. No offense if you're a big fan of Louis the Eighteenth. But he's, in my mind, being incredibly obtuse. I think he's just, he's not necessarily, I wouldn't say he's obtuse. He's just being, like, overly, just overly. He's just, like, a little pompous. Just a bit much. Yeah, he's a bit much. All right. That's all yours. Uh, Monsieur de Salvieux, my brother's chamberlain? Yes, sire. Oh, sorry, the, ki the king. He's got a sort of a guff. Monsieur de Salvieux. My brother's chamberlain? Yes, sire. He is at Marseille. And writes me thence. Does he speak to you of this conspiracy? No, but strongly recommends Monsieur de Villefort and beg me to present him to your majesty. Monsieur de Villefort, cried the king. Is the messenger's name Monsieur de Villefort? <laughs> yes, sire. <laughs> yes, I just said that. Yes, and he comes from Marseille? In person. Why did you not mention his name at once, replied the king, betraying some uneasiness. Sire, I thought his name was unknown to your majesty. No, no, Blaca, he is a man of strong and elevated understanding, ambitious too, and, par Dieu, you know his father's name. His father? Yes, Noirtier. Noirtier is a Girondin? Noirtier is a senator? He himself. And your majesty has employed the son of such a man? Blaca, my friend... You have but limited comprehension. I told you Villefort was ambitious, and to obtain this ambition, Villefort would sacrifice everything, even his father. <gasps> then, sir, may I present him? Is he just waiting outside? I, I wonder if he's hearing all of this. <laughs> this instant, Duke, where is he? Right behind me. No, uh, waiting below in my carriage. Seek him at once. I hasten to do so. The Duke left the royal presence with the speed of a young man. His really sincere royalism made him youthful again. Louis the Eighteenth remained alone, and turning his eyes on his half-open Horace, muttered, Justumetasum propositivirum. Uh, Justusum... Uh, something... Something about the truth? I... <laughs> I don't know. I got nothing. I, I didn't study Latin. Did you study Latin? I did not. I did not study Latin. Monsieur de Blackow returned as speedily as he had departed, but in the antechamber he was forced to appeal to the king's authority. Villefort's dusty garb, his costume, which was not of courtly cut, excited the susceptibility of Monsieur de Brise, who was all astonishment at finding oh, that this young man... De Brise. Who was all astonishment at finding that this young man had the audacity to enter before the king in such attire. The duke, however, overcame all difficulties with a word. His Majesty's order, and in spite of the protestations which the Master of Ceremonies made for the honor of his office and principles, Villefort was introduced. So he's got like a mater d who's like, Monsieur, the dress code does not include mud on the kneecaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, Black Eyes like, there's no time. <laughs> it's exactly. a king at once. This is an emergency. Exactly. The king was seated in the same place where the Duke had left him. On opening the door, Villefort found himself facing him, facing him, and the young magistrate's first impulse was to pause. Come in, Monsieur de Villefort, said the king. Come in. 
Villefort bowed, and, advancing a few steps, waited until the king should interrogate him. Monsieur de Villefort, said Louis the Eighteenth, the Duke de Blaca assures me you have some interesting information to communicate. Sire, the Duke is right, and I believe your majesty will think it equally important. Why don't you take it from here? Oh, first of all, let's check out this picture, though. We King got Louis the Eighteenth and Monsieur de Villefort. I was expecting Louis to have a much bigger wig. Maybe we're past that that Louis era, wig but man. I was expecting like massive, sort of like Isaac Newton wig. Um, yeah, we're not. I don't think. I think we're way past. Are that. we? We're in like the late eighteen hundreds. Late eighteen right? hundreds, yeah. So yeah, he's not so. It's more like Ebenezer Scrooge era. It's like turn of the like industrial revolution sort of oh, thing. Almost, yeah. Okay. It's like the the it's like Queen Elizabeth's like grandparents kind of time, right? Yeah. Picture. Okay. Queen Victoria. <laughs> I yeah. could not tell you. All right. Um. In the first place, and before everything else, sir, is the news. Uh, oh, is this the king? Oops. Yeah, I think so. In the first place, and before everything else, sir, is the news as bad, in your opinion, as I am asked to believe? Sire, I believe it to be most urgent, but I hope by the speed I have used that it is not irreparable. Speak as fully as you please, sir, said the king, who began to give way to the emotion which had showed itself in Blackhaz's face and affected Villefort's voice. Speak, sir, and pray begin at the beginning. I like order in everything. Sire, said Villefort, I will render a faithful report to your majesty, but I must entreat your forgiveness if my anxiety leads to some obscurity in my language. A glance at the king after this discreet and subtle exordium assured Villefort of the benignity of his august auditor, and he went on. Oof. <laughs> um, it's like $20 words Seriously. Being, being dropped here. Sire, I have come as rapidly to Paris as possible to inform your majesty that I have discovered, in the exercise of my duties, not a commonplace and insignificant plot, such as is every day got up in the lower ranks of the people and in the army, but an actual conspiracy, a storm which menaces no less than your majesty's throne. Sire, the usurper... Is he making this up? Sire, the usurper is arming three ships... He meditates some project which, however mad, is yet perhaps terrible. At this moment he will have left Elba to go whither I know not, but assuredly to attempt a landing either at Naples or on the coast of Tuscany or perhaps on the shores of France. Your Majesty is well aware that the sovereign of the Isle of Elba has maintained his relations with Italy and France. I am, sir, said the king, much agitated, and recently we have had information that the Bonapartist clubs have had meetings in the Rue Saint-Jacques. I like the idea that there are Bonapartist clubs, like there's like bowling clubs, Bonapartist clubs. <laughs> Bonapartist bowling? Yeah, like maybe they put on like the hat. They've got like... The hat? Like the, the Napoleon hats. Oh. <laughs> it's like, the are Napoleon? you part of the club? Yeah. yeah. Everyone, we've got the handshake, special handshake. Yeah. yeah. Uh... Uh, la, 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 la. Right, so they've been meeting up. Um, but proceed, I beg of you. How did you obtain these details? Sire, they are the result of an examination which I have made of a man of Marseille. Oh, I hate you, Villefort, so much. Yeah. Whom I have watched for some time and arrested on the day of my departure. This person, a sailor of turbulent character and whom I suspected of Bonapartism, has been secretly to the island of Elba. There he saw the Grand Marshal, who charged him with an oral message to a Bonapartist in Paris, whose name I could not ex extract from him. Uh, A.K.A. his, his dad. His dad, yeah. But this mission was to prepare men's minds for a return. It is the man who says this, sire. A return which will soon occur. And where is this man? Oops. In prison, sire. And the matter seems serious to you. So serious, sire, that when the circumstance surprised me in the midst of a family festival on the very day of my betrothal, I left my bride and friends, postponing everything, that I might hasten to lay at your majesty's feet the fears which impressed me and the assurance of my devotion. My nose, so brown. <sighs> Sorry, that, that came off as a sort of 
faux Italian there. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, take, take let's a, close her out. Home. True, said Louis the Eighteenth. Was there not a marriage engagement between you and Mademoiselle de Saint Marin, daughter of one of Your Majesty's most faithful servants? Yes, yes. But let us talk of this plot, Monsieur de Villefort. Sire, I fear it is more than a plot. I fear it is a conspiracy. Ba, ba, ba. Burr, burr, burr. A conspiracy in these times, said Louis the Eighteenth, smiling, is a thing very easy to meditate. Meditate, okay, but more difficult to conduct to an end. Inasmuch as re-established so recently on the throne of our ancestors, we have our eyes open at once upon the past, the present, and the future. Okay, so he's like, it's easy to come up with a conspiracy, but much more difficult to pull one off because mm -hmm. we've, we're so smart, okay? And we got our eyes open. For the last 10 months, my ministers have redoubled their vigilance in order to watch the shore of the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. If Bonaparte landed at Naples, the whole coalition would be on foot before he could even reach Piombino. If he landed in Tuscany, he would be in an unfriendly territory. If he landed in France... It must be with a handful of men, and the result of that is easily foretold, execrated as he is by the population. The courage, sir. But at the same time, rely on our royal gratitude. Ah, here is Monsieur Dandre, cried uh, de Blaca. At this instant, the minister of police appeared at the door, pale, trembling, and as if, and as if ready to faint. Villefort was about to retire, but Monsieur de Blaca, taking his hand, restrained him. Sir, restrain yourself. Wow. Okay. So, um, let's let's switch back to the camera and let's talk about this. This was a weird chapter that kind of was like split into two halves tonally. Yeah. The first half or like third was like these three dudes chatting, kind of in a meandering way about the potential threat well, of Napoleon. De Blaca is the one who I think was sent to introduce Villefort yeah. and I think he's trying to lead up to it like hey I got this guy and maybe we missed part of the conversation because I, I think we kind guess. of like we entered this this conversation kind of what's the word in uh, in, in situ or like yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah. whatever it is like uh it was already underway so but it was I, weird they were just like mm, 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 chatting and then all of a sudden it was like I got this guy he's ready to see you now I have a feeling like I, as soon as he said De Villefort that's when the king was like, bah. I'm awake. I'm like, bleh, 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 bleh. send yeah. him in because that's a name of a horse of a different yeah. color. I just kind of feel like that first bit. Like we could have got, we could have cut. I agree. I agree. Like if it did anything, it established, I think, a sort of a character for Louis the 18th at least. I don't really get the sense of what how Blaca and what's his name? Uh, uh, D'Andre. Yeah. I don't really get a sense of who they are. I get a pretty clear sense of who Louis the Eighteenth is in this in this chapter. Mm. Uh, at least the the character that they have in this book seems quite pompous, but also um, I don't know. There is there is an intelligence there, but he is very like I don't know showboaty. Showboaty. That's a great way a great way of phrasing it. Like this this guy likes to showboat his books book learning, and uh, it's a little insufferable. T B H. Um, and so, you know, at the end of this, we've got De Villefort saying, hey, well, I guess we're, we're learning what may have been at least partially in that letter. Like, I yeah, wonder if that yes. letter was basically like, well, some of I this wonder. might be true. I, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, that is an awful lot to make up on the spot. And I think he read something that was like, yeah, there's a plot. There's a plot. Like, maybe Napoleon's going to invade. Plot. Right. He's going to invade. He's got three ships. And he was going to deliver it to some guy. Doesn't matter who. I'm not going to say who. It's That's my right. dad. That's right. Don't worry about it. What matters is I imprisoned the guy who sent the letter. So we don't have to worry about him anymore. Mm. Also, we can stop Napoleon. Also, maybe he's somehow going to make money off of this? Sell your stocks? I, I don't know. I think definitely getting closer to the king, though, will probably be profitable for him. Maybe okay. that's what he's thinking. Yeah, so, sell your stock. Sell your land. Sell your land. Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe because his dad owned stuff in the Mediterranean. I don't know. I have no idea. Well, we shall see. Um, yeah. You know, I, I do feel like I'm missing a lot of the, the sort of the 
political context. Yeah. Like we read up a bit on like Napoleon and the French Revolution and Napoleon and what the era was like. But I think And how Napoleon went out. And how Napoleon went out. He's kinda of exiled. Um but, you know, I, I do I do think that we're missing some more of the context of what France was like right around now. Maybe. What people were afraid of, what were the different factions, um you know what were the business interests like what what do you use land for in france geographically speaking like you have why would you sell the land for yourself like people work it and then you leave the land i guess yeah i don't know i don't even know where we are elba there's a river where's this ocean where where the are we where's elba? marseille this must be the south of france we must be talking about the south of france mm, yeah, right marseille, i think is on the south and if they're talking about tuscany we're talking about like the near the boot so there's this like here let's pull up a map of france yeah that's a good idea much better than us just guessing just guessing yeah um let's see here let's use this one so yeah they're down here Okay, yeah, Monaco is just around the corner. And so he's Italy. saying, sell your land. Sell your land. Is it because they worry about a French invasion? Maybe. Or a French invasion, a Bonapartist yeah. invasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't hold on to anything because it might be. Well, but then he's telling the king that it's, so hopefully they'll prevent that from happening. Where's Elba Island? If this is where Ooh, uh, Napoleon nice. is, that's very nice. Uh, I mean, if that's where Napoleon is, not bad. Good job, Napoleon. Okay. So he's oh, over here. Oh, he's like... He's hanging out near Tuscany. He's way closer to Italy than I thought. Yeah, okay. All right. Oh, sorry. Uh, I realize now that people can't see this. Whoops. So let me, let me switch over here. Uh, this is the island of Elba right here. This is Italy. And... And this is like, these are the beautiful shots of Elba. Like, maybe we should check that out sometime, yeah. IRL. Napoleon's just like scratching his back, like uh, chilling. <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, the king was saying, he's so itchy, but maybe it's because he's just relaxed. He's just, just like, so oh, chill. So nice. Uh, and then Marseille is down here. So, like, all the story is taking place in the south of France. In my mind, for some reason, maybe, oh, no, because we're in Paris. That, that scene just now happened in Paris. That's mm -hmm. up here. So, like, Villefort just booked it. He did, yeah. Just booked it up here. Um, okay. Getting a sense of it. But still, I don't really super understand the sociopolitical stuff. And, but maybe more more will be revealed in the next more chapter. Chapter revealed. 11. But that's going to have to wait another time. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you so much for uh, listening to us read Chapter 10 of The Count of Monte Cristo. I'm Mike. I'm Em. And we'll see you next time. And this is Gus. And that's yeah. Gus the dog. Can't you can't see him, him but he's yeah, a black Gus. poodle and he yeah, waves. Yeah, next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.